the Team Performance Podcast with Spencer Horn and Christian Napier. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Team Performance Winning Ways for Uncertain Times podcast. I'm Christian Napier, and I am joined by the real brains of the operation who happens to be wearing a Paisley shirt, breaking with the norm, bringing back Purple Rain, Prince Spencer Horn. <laughs> Spencer, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Well, I'm doing a lot better now that I've seen you wearing this Paisley shirt, and you're no you longer in the royal it up purple. A little bit. You know where Paisley comes from, don't you? Where does it come from, Spencer? You know Give those us a cypress trees lesson. that grow like in the Middle East or Lebanon, and they blow in the wind. That's that's the theme where that actually comes from. Well, I've learned something new today, as I do every day when we have a conversation, Spencer. So thank you very much for the education. <laughs> you know, it's so good to be with you. you know, we it seems like uh, it's been a while since we've had a had a chat, and uh, a, a lot has happened since we last spoke. But uh, what's new with you? Well, gosh, I'm trying to remember when was the last time we spoke? Was it last week? Yeah, well, it was last week, but you know, it, it's we usually talk in between that. But yeah, I think we talked Patrick last week. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I think the the new thing for me, our daughter has started up at University of Utah. She has one class, physical uh, a physical class. The rest are online, and she's also taking some institute classes, which are also uh, in person classes as well. So that's probably the big the big update from from my side of the pond how about you spencer That's, well that is fantastic my my youngest is headed back to um university tomorrow and then uh, two of my kids uh, well one is a son-in-law and one's my daughter they're they're headed back to to school he's already back in law school and she's she starts in a little bit but the big news was i got to climb mount timpanogos since we last spoke oh that's and right i saw the post on facebook yeah. And I, my toe, my big toes, I didn't tighten my, my boots enough. So my big toes are both completely bruised, just, you know, rubbing against the, the boot and, and coming down. I mean, it's, it's like 4,400 feet, you know, as we did like 12 miles in one day, but it is, that is a tough hike. Well, especially if I, you're yeah, a pansy I, like I, me. I, well, talk about pansy. I pant whenever I go up and down the stairs in my house. So <laughs> Ascending 4,400 feet in uh, vertical in in a day, uh, definitely not my cup of tea. But I imagine that we have somebody on our podcast that, who could do that. Uh, we we do, and, and, and I want to get to that. But first, I, I want to delay one more second, because I've often wondered if it makes sense for us to even have this. I love having this banter with you. And I'm thinking, you know what? Our listeners want us to get to the, to the point. And I, I learned something that actually is a reason why you should do this. You know, a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are having Zoom meetings. They're doing it regularly. They have company meetings. They have client meetings. And it seems that when you get on that Zoom meeting, you want to just, boom, get into business. And what has been found with research right now is that the, the leaders that are stopping to actually check in and have conversation find that the, the meetings go better. Sales calls that actually have meaningless, let's call it meaningless banter, actually help grease the conversation, if you will, to improve negotiation. So all of this stuff that we're doing in the beginning, Christian, actually has unknowingly a huge benefit. You mean we didn't calculate it? We did it. It just <laughs> felt right, but it feels right. And it's, and it's right, even though it takes a little extra time and, and our poor guest is sitting there waiting for us to introduce her. <laughs> well, let's, let's not delay it any further because she has been very patient uh, listening to us go back and forth. And she is in a stunning uh, laboratory. It looks like very uh, hot pink, purple, lavender. I don't know what that color is, but it's amazing. So Spencer, why don't you introduce our guest? Uh, Jax is, is, is a, is a dear friend and I'm so grateful. She did that actually for me because, you know, she, she hears us talking about purple all the time. So she went and did purple in her background, but, but I met, uh, Jax Scott or Jacqueline Scott through our work together with the Shiro foundation. And Jax has, you know, she's served on many boards and her passion has been to really help 
uh, support women and children affected by by sex trafficking and abuse and neglect. And that's what really got us introduced uh, to each other. Right, Jax? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that was in 2015 or 16, the Shiro yeah. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that's a while ago. And, you know, you've held uh, you, you worked on different organizations as well that, that have that similar mission. And you are I, I just I, I love your story and your experience. You are a for those of you who are listening, you know, she's a, a tenured special operations warrant officer. Um, and, and basically, you know, she gets to she has I, I like to glamorize it a little bit. I mean, but, you know, she carries big guns and, and kicks indoors and, and 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 works with with special operations groups. But she's a tech blogger. She's a business owner. She's a senior analyst in global intelligence. And that's really a lot of the work that she was doing in special operations is going and, and uh, working on on intelligence. You know, when you work in the Middle East and, and she'll explain it. It's hard sometimes for the for the men to do, get all the intelligence that they need. And so she has been embedded with these groups, these special operations groups to gather intelligence. And it takes um, a, a mentality that is a warrior mentality. And, and Jax has this and it's and I'm so excited for her to talk a little bit about that. Um, She's served on nonprofit boards, as I've said. She gives tactical advice to reduce injury to women and children. Um, it, I love that she actually teaches self-defense. She teaches women about uh, um, self-defense and, and weapons use, which is fantastic. We'll talk a little about that. And she has been providing security uh, and cybersecurity guidance to foreign leaders. She travels to foreign countries all the time. I mean, I'll call her and she's like, well, yeah, I'm in, you know, I'm in Ukraine or I'm in Germany. Or I'm in France. And I'm like, I can't talk to you right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm on lockdown. I'll, I'll text you in a couple months when I get off of whatever I'm doing. But she's, she's a military <laughs> expert in cyber policy and, and countermeasures. And this is what I know. What is it? What is a near pair attack? A near peer is like um, somebody that has similar capabilities as yourself. So looking at like, say, Russia, that would be a near peer adversary for us. That's somebody that could um, impact us in a similar way that we could impact them within. And I'm speaking from a cyber perspective as well. Yeah. So when you go into the field, you want to have you want to have tactical advantage. You want to be you want to win when you hit that that field. And so when you're talking about a peer, that takes extra precaution and extra measures. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sun Tzu, so, know your enemy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she, she has nearly 17 years of experience working in these military operations uh, where she worked with a special unit that offered gender-specific intelligence and security solutions. Fascinating. Um, and she's committed to her growth as a leader. She is currently finishing... You're finishing your master's degree at Georgetown University in cybersecurity and risk management. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, it will be cool once I get the certificate too. <laughs> yeah, but you're it's always a, working fun. on yourself. And, and you know, it's, yeah. I'm so proud of you and everything that you do. And, and you're you. so committed. And I'm so glad to have you on our show today. Thank you, Spencer. I was really, really excited when you asked me. I think, gosh, I think it was over a month ago, maybe even two months when you had initially asked me. And at that time, I was definitely in a transition point in my life, and I was really excited about what you were doing. So obviously, I said, hang on, let me get some things taken care of. And then in the interim, I obviously did my homework about what you and Christian were doing. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you both. So glad to have you. Now, I, I want to talk to you about Listen, I mean, this is this is a team performance podcast, but I, we'll get to the team side. You've had a lot of opportunity to work on some high performing teams, and I, and I want you to tell that story. But what what made you get into this? I mean, special operations, cybersecurity, uh, going to put your life at, at at risk. I mean, what what was the motivation? Yeah, so I thought about this question because you and I had kind of briefly chatted about this a few days ago and just kind of catching up. And 
something that I have to bring to light is just basically my background and where I came from. I didn't come from the best childhood. And I think that that played a lot into why I chose this field. Um, I was already conditioned from a really young age to be in a high, high stress environment and be able to operate in that type of environment, as well as um, overcoming challenges. I had a speech impediment when I was a young kid. I was homeschooled. It was one thing after another. So for me, and I've realized as I've gotten older, I see challenges as an opportunity. And going into the special ops, I just saw as an opportunity to push myself to limits that I never knew would be possible unless I attempted and tried it. So here you are, you, you know, you, you've had these these challenges. Why then are you... So, so I, there's got to be a correlation there between protecting women and, and children. I mean, you, you must have seen or experienced something what was it that that you wanted to be able to do for for women to help them to be to feel safe to be to be okay yeah sure that's a really good question and that goes back to again me as a as a young girl and as a woman i've had to find my voice in this world i was not taught to have a voice or nor was i protected i would say as a young child um you know i've had abusive relationships i've been raped and it ha was a pattern in my life and the only reason that pattern stopped is because i was able to empower myself and that em that empowerment came through overcoming challenges in my life. And I believe that to be able to give back to other women and teach them firearms or self-defense training, I am able to empower them in a way that allows them to have that voice. And uh, it means the world to me when I'm able to go out there and to teach a woman how to actually just hold a fire and not even shoot it, how to take it apart and put it back together and then see how their entire demeanor changes, how they're how they actually, you will physically watch a group of women completely change their posture and hold themselves taller simply by learning how to take apart a gun and put it back together. And that means the world to me. I love that. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit speechless because you have never told me that before. And, um, thank you very much for, for sharing that. That is, that, that is a very personal thing and yet so, so powerful because when I, when I see you, I see this woman who is confident, that is so well-spoken and talented. I remember we were talking about the first time I ever saw you. You're so aware <laughs> of your surroundings. You're, you're, you know, <laughs> you were, you were from a way you were kind of checking me out. And I don't mean in any, any weird way. I'm just like, is this big guy a threat or what? <laughs> you know, you come into a room and you look at all the threat and assess the situation. That's what I felt you were doing when you saw me. Absolutely. We talked about this. You were the biggest guy in the room. And I was I was invited to a, an event, that event through a friend. I didn't know anybody there, minus that one person that invited me. And I was trying to get my fill and lay of the land. And then here comes this like giant. And I'm like, I see you. I got you. All right. <laughs> Tallest dude in the room. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it cracked me up. I, I understand that a little bit better now. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I, I totally agree with you on, on the guns. I mean, we have, you know, I have three daughters and we teach them and we we shoot guns and we have ever since they're kids, I mean, rifles. And now we have handguns and, you know, we're very careful and we're very safe and we're all, we're doing, we're going through uh, gun safety and, and, and uh, concealed carry, all that kind of stuff. But it's so awesome to see them know how to take it apart. And you're exactly right. Just the confidence in that space is it just translates to other areas in their life, which is really interesting, I find. Yeah, and firearms, that was a big thing that we were doing with my company, Tactical Divas in Las Vegas, as you are aware of. And it's something that I was able to trans transition over into other areas because I'm aware that there's some women that don't want to be involved with firearms. And so I want to be very clear. You don't have to use firearms to empower women. This could be through a self-defense training. This could simply be lending them an air to talk to them, to give them techniques to have goal setting. It's all about taking control back into their lives. And that's all that is. It's understanding a piece of equipment that they've never understood before is 
it's such a unique way of empowering them that once I started doing it and I saw the shift in these women's lives, I realized that this was the direction that I wanted to go was to impact women's lives in the long, long term, eventually. One of the things, Jax, that I find interesting as I'm listening to you talking is that this shift in a person's behavior and their sense of self um, can be done with relatively minimal effort and time. You know, I, people can see I got a keyboard back here. If if you want to be a proficient musician, I mean, you have to spend thousands of hours uh, practicing an instrument to to become a professional level musician and become really proficient. But in in your case, someone doesn't need ten thousand hours of practice with a firearm to feel safe. And so, I just want to talk. I, I want to ask you the question. You know, um, in in the in your experience and the in the work that you've do, that you've been doing, you know. How much time and effort does it take to help an individual pivot from uh, a, a, a place where they don't feel safe, they don't feel secure, to a place where they feel more self-assured? Yeah, so I'm going to take that from the stance that they're not in an abusive relationship, but it's more of a mental mindset. That's that's kind of where I'm going to take that, that my reply. So if somebody I'm dealing with or I know of a friend that is in a mental headspace that, that is not healthy, I truly believe that if they will dedicate 10 to 15 minutes a day to their mental health, because what it is, it's a whole body experience and it, it, it ties in the spiritual health and you've got physical health, but if they will spend 10 to 15 minutes a day, that might be writing, aka journaling, that might be doing meditation in the morning, um, that might be reading a book that is a, like a self-help or something to encourage them, it will help them immensely. And I always tell women, take an inch, because after a month of taking an inch, you might be six, six feet ahead than you were yesterday. You might not take an inch on on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You may take an inch on Thursday and Friday, and that's okay. But it's just making those small sacrifices every single day, and it will show show huge impact in these women's lives. And I see it. I see it in myself actually, because I preach what I do on a daily basis, and it's it's not easy. But you just have to commit to it. And when you do, and you make those small micro steps a day, it has huge impacts in your life. You know, I so agree with that. I mean, there, there's so often we feel like to make big shifts, we we have to we have to take big action, and I I love that. I mean, there's a there's a process that I that I share with a lot of you know my coaching clients, and it's called the daily questions. And we figure out, Jackson and Christian, maybe one behavior that they want to get better at, and we just figure out what are what are some of the things that just a few steps that you could take and just kind of evaluate yourself every day on a scale from one to 10. How'd you do today? And don't worry if you did a four, you know, or you had a three today, but just start thinking about it, right? It, you know, just, Hey, I took a couple minutes. And so maybe today it's a five. Mm -hmm. And as you start doing that, you just, and don't judge yourself when you have a couple of bad days in a row, just be curious. Why, why did I struggle with that? And as you start to, to focus on that, that 10 minutes every day doing those things, it now starts to become a habit. And pretty soon before you know it, that, that's a behavior that you've made part of your life. And so now you can start working on the next one. You're absolutely right. You nailed it. I always say if we, uh, women are really good about taking care of others, especially when they have children. But if we don't stop and take that five to 10 minutes a day, say you do 10 minutes a day, that's an hour and 10 minutes a week. You can make that happen. You can set aside and put your child, have them like eating their bowl of cereal, whatever the situation is, your husband comes home, take 10 minutes out because I promise you, you will find something that you didn't deal with the day before or something that's aggravating you that day. And like you said, Spencer, it's, it's just recognizing it. And I always think of things just flowing through your ear. Like it, you recognize it, you, you validate, okay, that I do feel this way. It's okay to feel frustrated. Why do I feel frustrated? Okay, got it. I'm either going to accept where it's at, I'm going to change it, I'm going to address it, or I'm just going to let it go and move on. Um, and in 10 minutes, and if you don't get to everything in 10 minutes, you write it down and deal with it tomorrow. And you just, you keep moving through it. 
Um, that's probably the number one recommendation I can give to any individual that male or female alike, even my mentors, that the individuals that I mentor, I tell them it's a whole life approach. This isn't just a, a big drastic change. You have to do small steps to get there. One thing that I live by is a vision statement. And I tell people, write down where, who you are in three years. Don't make it passive or who you write down that person, feel it, breathe into it. And, and the mission vision statement should be about three to five sentences long. And it should say words like confidence and um, outspoken or the things that they feel weak in now. It should emphasize where they're at because they've accomplished it. And then what they do is they take that and they repeat it as they're brushing their teeth every morning and every night for 21 days. And then they post it, you post it all over your house, in your car, on your phone, everywhere. And you, every time you, you actually read, read it, you breathe into it and you feel that person that you are, because you're going to be that person in three years. Jax, do you, do you ever find though, that as you help people make that vision statement that they struggle with that future vision because of where they are today. So they can't actually visualize where they could be or where they, where they want to be because they only see what's here. And, and how do you get them to see what's, what's possible? Such a good question. So uh, actually it was a month ago, I had a new mentor and I had him do this very, very, this, this vision exercise and he wrote out the vision exercise and just like you said he was having so he was having struggles and what i've noticed is individuals will talk almost in third person a lot of times they'll say um i am a leader that leads with um passion and drive and focus and i'm like but I feel like I'm, and I told him, I went, I feel like I'm reading somebody else right now because you don't believe it. And that's okay. And I tell him that's okay because you don't believe what you're writing. So let's take it a few steps back and figure out what do you believe? Because maybe you don't have that leadership feel right now, but maybe you have that mentor because he was mentoring individuals at the time. I'm like, so you're a mentor. So you're a natural leader. So maybe you lean into what your natural leadership capabilities are. And then you emphasize that a little bit more. One thing I can say about these vision statements is it's going to be rough the first time they write it. And I expect it to be rough. And when they write it, I tell them this is a li living, breathing document. And so they need to revisit that every single month. And when they're going through and they're filling the, the, into that vision statement every day in the evening, when they're brushing their teeth, they will naturally start editing that vision statement into a more ris realistic vision statement, as well as challenging themselves. Because as they read it, psychologically, they're starting to feel into it. And they're like, wow, no, I am a leader that's passionate, focused, and driven. And I am um, a, a steward of you know, information technology and response technical, whatever their field is. And you just drive into it. I should have actually gotten my vision statement that I oh, had. And, you know, uh, it's so but, great. Yeah, because, it's awesome. You don't, you don't focus on the how you're going to get there. You no. focus on the, my wife and I, Jana, yes. we did this a five-year plan, you know, several years ago, and we did, you know, seven areas. So spiritual, personal, relationship, physical, all these things. And it, I mean, we just put the most out, we listed like a hundred things and things that we wanted to do, places that we wanted to go. And you're like, how are we going to do this? Don't worry about that. Opportunities will, will present themselves. And I, and I love that you're, you're doing that. Um, you know, we, we have so much to talk about. This is so great. And I know Christian has other questions, but I want you to Let's back up a little bit and, and explain what is a warrant officer? What does that mean? How did you get there? So warrant officer, I always love this question because we are like the unicorn of the, the army. So really briefly, there's only two branches that have warrant officers. You've got the Navy and then you've got the army and they're very diversely different. Um, in the army, and I'll just speak from the army's perspective, we, you have to typically, unless you are promoted in and immediately go into a position that is a warrant, like a pilot, you typically have to hold your position as a non-commissioned officer. So you have to get, uh, what we call your stripes in the military, which usually takes about four to five years. So say you've five year mark, you become an NCO is what we call them. 
at that time, you typically have to hold that rank for six to eight years before you can even apply to become a warrant officer. So let's do, you know, um, beer math. That's about 12 to 13 years. So 12 to 13 (laughs) years, you, uh, you can now apply to become a warrant officer, but that's not your only hurdle. Now you, it has to go, you have to be congressionally selected and only two to 3% of the entire army becomes, receives the warrant officer rank after you go through warrant officer school and you put in this massive packet with letters of recommendation and all of this. Um, I, I will tell you, I applied twice. The first time I was denied, I had to wait over three years before I could reapply and be accepted into the program. And I was at I was at the 11 to 12 year mark when I was finally accepted into the becoming a warrant officer in the army. So, so impressive, you know, it's great. I want you to just explain a little bit to our listeners what this, this um, security or or intelligence gathering, what did it look like? What was the experience? Because I want you to just, I mean, I just, you know, I watch one of my favorite shows is uh, SEAL Team. I don't know if you ever watched that, but I, you know, I love Jason Borean. So you're like, oh, that's just a bunch of crap. Um, I just can't help it. I, I love it. So <laughs> whatever, but um, talk about what it's like for you. You, you know, you're, you're a young woman in a male dominated profession. There's no doubt about it. What's that like? Yeah. When, so when I joined the, when I was actually selected for the special ops program, I was 27 to going on 28 years old, I believe. So yeah, still fairly young, still trying to get my feet under me. I had literally just moved to a state where I knew nobody just a year prior. No, no prospects of jobs just kind of was making my life happen. I had just gotten out of divorce, all this stuff. And this opportunity came up to be part of a program called the cultural support team program. And I was approached by a officer friend of mine. He's like, you need to try out for this. This is, this is absolutely up your alley. Obviously we all know I made it. So made the program, but the life changing event for me was after I, we made the program, we were deployed into country into Northern Afghanistan. I was fortunate. I did two different operations. So my first set of operations, the point for these women to go in was to gather intelligence or gra- gather data, gather information from the women and children in Afghanistan. And why this was so important is because this was a culture that was untouched by the male population. And it was untouched in a way that the only people that could talk to the women were the, the, the women's husbands or any, any girls. If they were a young boy, you could it would be, you could talk to them, but any of the girls or women, you could not speak to them unless you were the dad or the husband of this family. So that was leaving us an information gap, as you can imagine. So they, the Special Operations Command decided to start this program where it was a group of women, they were two-man teams, and they embedded in with these Special Operations Green Beret and or the Army Rangers. And you had two different mission sets. Well, my mission set was called Village Stability Operations, where we worked at the government level. We lived in the villages side by side with the special operators, and we would go on operations with them. Now, my first rotation was very non-kinetic, so not no troops in contact. There was nothing too crazy, but it was very insightful because you were able to actually sit with and communicate with the culture because you had an interpreter, a female interpreter. So you would go into these villages, you would get information off of these women, you would, you know, bring that information back to your intelligence um, team, they would, they would figure out a way to use it, and then so on and so forth. What was really cool is because of my ability to network and develop relationships all over northern Afghanistan, I had received a good reputation and I was afforded an opportunity to do a second rotation. So I stayed in country without leaving. All my my team that was with me, everybody left. All of the women that initially came out there on the first rotation, all but three, three of us left. And I stayed in country in my next operation, which I, I literally, I remember the night, I got called from the headquarters and he was a warrant officer and he said, hey, 
we've heard about your reputation. We would like to move you over to our direct action team that's over in, it was a further place in Northern Afghanistan, and you would be running your own team. Basically, I would be promoted up. I'd be running my own team and it would be not doing night operations with this dive team. And so it was hard for me to accept it, to be honest, because I had just made, um, I had just, I had really bonded with the team that I was with. And this was like the fourth team I had worked with by now. So I debated it, but I accepted the offer. And then the rest was just, it was the most amazing experience of my life. I was able to work side by side with these guys um, operating on the front lines where we would actually do combat operations. Um, we did we did one operation where we were under fire for over 12 hours. And I believe that was the operation where I received my bronze star, which was a huge thing because I was an E6 at the time and only e rank of the E7 or above received that kind of um, medal to be, a, to be awarded to somebody. So I was beyond humbled and it, I created such a bond that I still talk to a lot of those men that were, that were on that team with me. The biggest thing that I really gained from that though is my voice to have courage and then being able to truly lean in, even though you knew you, I felt like I didn't belong, but I knew that I, ha I was supposed to have a seat at that table because this was the first time women had ever truly had a seat at the table, been part of the, the concept of operations, the con op, and you needed to almost fake it to make it. And it was a, it was a pivotal point in my life not only mentally and seeing what I saw, but just um, confidence within myself. So here we bring the two uh, streams together, the nexus of these two things that we've talked about today, right? So at the beginning, we, we talked a lot about the work that you're doing with women to help them feel safe and, and, uh, and find uh, mental health and strength uh, to, to achieve uh, an objective and, and fulfill a vision. And, now you're talking about your military experience and the importance of working well as part of a team and all of the successes that you achieved there in spite of all of the challenges and obstacles that were put in your way. So, you know, since we are a team performance podcast, I'm curious from your experience, how, how that mental well-being, how that mental health played a role in an area like Afghanistan and, and how does that work to help the team stay successful in such a, such a high pressure environment? Yeah, that's an awesome question, Christian. So for me, I, going back to what, like you said, what we initially talked about, I really believe that I was being trained for this level of stress, even from my childhood. And I, there was never a moment when I was out there through even when, so we have a, we have a saying in the military, you never know what you're going to do until you start getting shot at in real life. There can be, a, a, you know, you can go through as many stress shoots as you want to go through, but it's not till you're actually in combat situation when the rounds start flying that you're going to actually see who, who you are. Are you going to freeze or fight? And something that I noticed is, I didn't freeze. And there was I afraid? I, I didn't think about it at the time, but absolutely, if I look back on it, anybody would say, yes, I mean, that's a nervous spot to be in, but I wasn't beyond, there was never a point where the stress was too much for me or that I broke down. And I would say for, for any woman to get to that level, it's back to that mental health. It's knowing who you are, it's understanding and being in, in the here and now of that moment. But a lot of these times, unless you put yourself in stressful situations, and it doesn't have to be combat, it could be a Spartan race, it could be, you know, going back to college, but it could be learning how to shoot a gun, it could be learning how to play the piano, all of these are fears for everybody. And until you put yourself in these stressful situations, your mental capacity isn't going to be able to stretch, and you won't know how much of your tinsel strength, basically, how much you're going to be able to withstand when you're put in those situations. Unless you get out of that comfort zone, growth isn't happening. And you know, I, 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 when we talked last, what you talked about is leveling up, right? 
And, and so here you were, you were comfortable with your teams and, and you were almost a little disappointed to actually have to leave that and now go into a new environment where you're talking about all male teams, operators, except for you. And you're actually leading that team. And so there's a, a tendency. And, and if you think about, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to digress for a second. She said something that really struck me. She says, it's a non-kinetic. So would you, how would you like to have Christian, a, a, a job description that said you're in a kinetic environment, right? You, <laughs> so, so now she's yeah, going to go uh, into like, what's that word mean? Kinetic Kine- environment. I, mean, I don't even understand what it means. Firing at, at, at flying <laughs> past your face is what it means. And, uh, and you're like, pushing, you know, kicking doors in and, and grabbing people actually that might try to harm you. So here she is now leveling up to this kinetic environment. And one of the things I think about that, how does this relate to a woman who is in any industry? I mean, I, about 75% of my coaching clients are, are women. And so I, I, we talk about this a lot in, in, in an environment that may be male dominated. How do you, how do you overcome the, uh, this, thought that's called imposter syndrome, right? I, I mean, do, do I deserve to be here? Can I do this? How did you handle that? Yeah. So I was actually talking to, I have a friend in town from New York and she works for a cybersecurity firm. And I was actually talking to her about it today because I've been having some struggles at work. I feel like when you're in an environment that's a male dominated world, um, it's kind of like a, it, it's like a seesaw, like you're up and then you're down and then you're up and then you're down. Um, It goes back to meditation. It goes back to, I have a circle of very, very close individual friends that I reach to that help me. And then it's leveling up. It's making sure that I put my nose in that book and I educate myself or I research a little bit more. And I know, and I'm speaking from a cybersecurity perspective, perspective. It's going to be different for everybody else. But in my industry, you need to know what's going on. You need to know the threats as a cyber threat intel analyst. I need to know what is cutting edge. I need to know what is happening. I need to understand the different types of malware. And there's times, as of recently, I've been feeling really down. And I'm like, no, I, I deserve to be here. And I deserve to, to be at this, this virtual table. It's just believing in yourself, meditating, uh, if it, meditation isn't your thing, finding a way to release that and then having close friends and not, and, and when I say close friends, my friends, when I reach out to them, I have two in particular, they don't just tell me what I need to, they tell me what I need to know, not what I want to hear. So if I'm actually not doing well in my mind, they're going to tell me, you need to change your mindset about this instead of like, yeah, he's just terrible. I can't, that's, that's a toxic friend. You want people in your life that are going to lift you up? Absolutely. But they also need to speak truth. So that's really interesting because as we were going through this conversation, and I'm thinking about the mental well-being aspect and taking 10 or 15 minutes out a day, it sounds to me like it's very much an individual responsibility, which it is, right? We We have responsibility for ourselves. But at the same time, there's some kind of collective responsibility, and I guess also a desire to help other people when you are in a good place. And that's really what's inspired the work that you're doing. So, and, and you talked about your friends uh, helping you out. So, what is the importance of support in a team? You know, uh, so it's not just everybody is out for themselves and taking care of their own individual responsibility, but we have some kind of collective. Uh, responsibility to look out for each other and make sure that we're all okay. Yeah, so that's that's something I've uh, it, that is instilled being in the military. But when you get into what I call corporate America, uh, you know the the public or the private sector, it's a little bit different, and you don't have that brother or sisterhood as much as you do within the military because that's just a natural thing. When you go to war with somebody, you just have a bond with them. When you're under stress with somebody else, you have a bond with them. And what I have had to realize as, as I have slowly progressed into the uh, private sector is being okay with asking for help. And I know that that seems like, oh, you're a warrant officer, but a lot of times in the military, even though we have that brother and sister next to us, it, it's almost an implied task. You don't ask, you ask for help, but it's, 
people are going to help you or um, it's just going to be part of their duties, but it's different. And it's something that I've had to learn and grow into uh, just in the last like year or two is to be okay with opening up to my friends and asking for help, uh, opening up to my team and asking for them for help because I'm underwater on a white paper and I need their assistance and trust that they can provide me with the necessary critiques or technical expertise. It's, it's harder said than done though, Christian. That's probably been one of my harder challenges for me to be okay with asking for help because I used to see it as a weakness or relying on my team. I used to see it as a weakness. I, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I, I love that you said that because it, it it shows a vulnerability and you have just come from an environment where you don't want to show that vulnerability, where you want to show that that courage and that bravado, right? To, to kind of level up, as you said. But I, to me, that takes a tremendous amount of emotional intelligence for you to recognize that, hey, I don't have the same environment. I need to adjust and I need to be able to be vulnerable. It takes a very powerful leader to be able to, to come back down and say, I, I'm underwater. I love that. Yeah. In the military, they do not uh, applaud you for uh, saying, I don't know, or asking a question. I know they always say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there is, especially in the special ops community that it just, there is. <laughs> and it's different being out in the corporate world and having a voice and being okay with saying, if I can't research it in Google, which I typically do, if I'm in a meeting, I write down, okay, what are they saying? I actually don't know that acronym. And if it's something where I can, I'm researching and I'm in a meeting and I can't find it on Google, then at that point in time, I might virtually raise my hand and say, Hey, can you guys, can you guys elaborate on what this acronym is or what you're meaning in the context of this? More times than not, that has actually done me good. And I can't even think of a time where it hasn't done me, hasn't been in my favor. It's just, it's being vulnerable, like you said, Spencer. And it's one of the hardest things that I have had to do in the last year or two. And, but it's been very rewarding for me. Well, I have a question and you don't necessarily need to divulge any specifics, but coming back to the personal vision statement, when did you create yours and how are you doing on your own journey? Yeah, good question. So I created mine probably because I revamped mine. So I probably, I'm looking at, I have part of it on my wall over here. I've I have three words that are all over my house, confident, patience, kind. And at the beginning of this year, right before, I think it was right before COVID, I did a revamp on my vision statement. But in doing so, I picked out three words that I wanted to be better at. And they were confident, patient, and kind. And that's not just to individuals, but really to myself. And so where I revamped this year was learning to give myself a break and be okay when I can't meditate for 10 minutes that day or when, I, when I'm failing at doing 150 things in a day and maybe I can only do 90. And so that's, yeah, I actually probably, I try to revamp my vision statement every quarter or when I feel inspired, when something has triggered and I feel like I've leveled up, it's time to re, reinvent that vision statement a little bit more. What happens when you arrive or do you ever arrive at your destination? You know, if you, you have this idea, oh, I'm going to create this vision statement where I'm going to be in three years, but you're continually revamping it, you're refining it, uh, you're tweaking it to your current circumstance. Do you ever arrive anywhere or is it all about the journey? Yeah, that's something I'm working on right now because... I don't ever arrive. And when I, when I arrive, okay, I do arrive. I arrive at my small goals, my, my small achievements to accomplish my big dream, AKA my vision statement. And something that I've been really working on is being patient and kind with myself to uh, when I got accepted into Georgetown to soak that up and pat myself on the back. And that's huge. That from where I came from in my childhood and where I'm at today makes no sense. But it's because of the hard work. But usually I'm like, cool, got it in. Now I got to move on to textbooks and this and that and got to accomplish. So I want to be able, so back to your question, I want to be able to arrive, but I also, I want, I want to be able to arrive, but I don't know if that is, 
arriving at the small goals. And those that's where I make my achievement while I still keep maintaining a revision of that, that mission statement. Because as you grow and as you accomplish these small micro goals along the way, it's inevitably that vision statement is going to change. So I don't think you're ever going to fully arrive at the vision, but you will arrive at each big to small goal along the way. And that's when you need to take a pause and appreciate all of your hard work getting there. I, I, I sense the emotion there a yeah. minute ago. And, uh, and I'm so excited that, that, you, that you recognize that. And one of the things that is not just unique to you, Jax, but all high achievers, you are a high achiever. And a lot of high achievers are never satisfied. It's always about what's next, what's next. And that can cause a lot of hypertension. It can cause a lot of, uh, you know, you talk about having confidence and people listening to how articulate, how confident and how powerful you are as a speaker. They're like, confidence? But they don't understand the battle that goes on in your head about, you know, having to do more and more and more. But sometimes just you got to stop and celebrate you got to celebrate. You don't have to do it too long. It's like winning the game, right? It's like, we won tonight. Let's have a party tonight. And then tomorrow we're going to prepare for the next game. Mm-hmm. And that's And that's what I just heard you say. And uh, Christian, I mean, you, you're in sports. I mean, you, you, ha- you see it all the time working in the Olympics. I mean, don't you agree? Oh, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I... I I have found this uh, conversation really quite inspirational, Jack. So I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your, and being very vulnerable and, and uh, transparent and open uh, with Spencer and and with me and with our listeners. And when it comes to our listeners, um, you've shared a lot of great pieces of advice so far, but if there, if there's one message that maybe you haven't yet communicated, but one thing that you really want to leave with them, uh, what would it be? Mm. take time to do self-reflection, whatever that is. Um, if that's meditation, if that's reconnecting with a, uh, you know, a spiritual friend or somebody that, uh, is in a good place in their life, or maybe it's trying something that you've wanted to try that you've been scared of. Maybe it's a new language. Maybe it's playing the piano. All of those are going to create self-reflection in yourself. And that's, if I could tell anybody anything, start doing some self-reflection. You know, I, I'm selfishly because, uh, you know, it's been a long time to get, it's been longer than a month, Jax, it's taken to get you on here. <laughs> yeah. So I selfishly just want you to talk about one more thing. And um, this is, again, I, I'm going to ask you to be a, a little bit vulnerable here, you know, as a, a as a single young woman, um, you appear a, a lot younger than, than you are. And so what happens a lot of times is people underestimate you, right? And and we talked about what that's like in, a, in an alpha-dominated industry. And how do you get recognized? How do you get noticed? We talked about what you did to overcome that and to get noticed. And, and if you're out there listening and you are a man or a woman that is maybe underestimated, why is that okay? And, and what did you do about it? Gosh, that... So I'll tell you what I used to do, and they might not have been the most healthy approaches, but it it worked at the time. But being a woman in a male-dominated industry and then running a defense contracting firm in a male-dominated industry, I used to wear a wedding ring on my left finger. And I used to portray myself in that way because when you walk into a meeting room, you received more respect as a married woman, plus I look younger than my age. So I I was a married woman and that went into a slew of, well, she's probably a mother and all these other responsibilities. So I received more credibility. Um, And I did other certain things. Like, obviously I would, I would dress myself down. I wouldn't wear makeup. I'd wear my hair in a ponytail. I'd be very business suit wise, slacks on, no heels, maybe a small heel, wedding ring on. image is important, Jax, is what you're telling me. Yes. Today though, I still have a professional appearance. I don't wear a wedding ring. And I just make sure that before I go into that meeting, and I've done this before, I just make sure that I know exactly who's going to be in that meeting room and what is the topics and what do I need to know. And I go in as confident, not having too much, no ego, but confident. 
and I am who my, who I am. And I, I don't worry about how they're going to perceive me. I know it's going to be out there. And it goes back to that mental awareness. Know that it's out there. Know that there's a possibility that's going, that that is going to happen to you, but don't let it cripple you. Let it go right. in one ear, acknowledge it, prepare for it, but then let it, let it flow out and be who you are. I, one of the things that you said to me that you, you, you basically said it circumlocution wise, you just talked around it is, is you didn't complain. Even if you no. were underestimated or even if someone treated you like you didn't want to be treated, you didn't complain and you just put your, you, you just said, I'm, I'm going to move past this and they're going to, I'm going to earn their respect. It's kind of like what you said. You put your nose in your book, you figure out what you need to do and, and don't tell yourself a story that, you know, oh my gosh, this, this is, a, this environment is terrible. These people are terrible. It's never going to be great. You acted like you belong there. Yeah, I always say that there's a three month mark typically. I've every time I got onto a new ODA operation attachment alpha um, team or started a new job or anything, typically three months. And I would go in there. I got to know my environment, the people I worked with. I became as smart as I could on whatever I was working on. And within three months, by just doing my job and showing up. I got respect. And that's the number one thing that I could tell somebody that's struggling in this right now is uh, obviously if it's a toxic environment, get out of it. But if you're just struggling to be accepted, again, self-reflection, understand who you are, identify why you feel that way because it's an insecurity in yourself, but, and that's okay. Just identify it and then level up, you know, level up and work. But if you're still not happy, I want to be very clear that if you're not happy in a job or where you're at in your life and you have tried certain things and you feel like you've exhausted yourself, get out of there. You don't need to be in that. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate Jax, all the information and the knowledge that you've shared. I do have to say just on a personal note, um, last week I was in California. I was visiting with my uncle who is now older and um, was a career Navy person uh, and was a warrant officer in the Navy. And, uh, and so uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your experiences in the military. And thank you for protecting us and keeping us safe uh, through the work that you do. And speaking of that work, if people want to learn more about the things that you're doing on the cybersecurity side, or if they want to connect with you to learn more about how you might be able to help them with uh, mental well-being, uh, what's the best way for them to reach out and contact? Or how you? to get confident with guns? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yes, confident with guns. I haven't played with the. I haven't done any training in a while. I'd love to do that. I, the best two ways to reach me is my LinkedIn. Just uh, find me through my name, Jacqueline.Scott or Jacqueline Scott or Jack Scott. And I also have a tech blog. You can find me on there at Beans and Bites. Bites spelled B-Y-T-E-S, like Tech Bites. So beansandbitesblog.com. And reach out to me on either platform. I'm, I'm feverishly on LinkedIn all the time. I love connecting and I would love to connect with anybody. I, yeah, provide feedback. Let's connect. Let's make something happen. I'm game. Fantastic. And Spencer, how about you? What's the best way for people to reach out and contact you? Thank, thank you, Christian. And I just, before I do that, I'm so grateful that you came and I am so proud to know you and, and all the work that, that you have done and, and for absolutely making a difference to our country and our security, uh, both kinetic and non-kinetic security i i appreciate and uh, people can reach me at spencer at altiumleadership.com that's a-l-t-i-u-m leadership.com my website's the same altiumleadership.com thank you spencer and uh people can reach me at cnapier at gp4.com that's g-p-f-o-u-r.com or you can visit the website gp4.com listeners thank you for taking the time viewers thank you for taking the time please like and subscribe to our podcast and we'll talk again soon thanks guys